Hello and welcome to Chat with an Astronomer. I'm Lila. I'm a PhD researcher at the Impress Bonn Cologne. And as you might know, in this series, we would like to introduce to you some of the researchers here at, at the Impress and all the fascinating research that they're doing in astronomy and astrophysics. So my guest today is Sandra Unruh. Uh, Sandra is a final year PhD student, so she's almost at the end of her PhD and uh, she's working on cosmology and gravitational lensing. So she's dealing with how the universe evolves and all the big questions that come with that. And I'm really interested in what she has to tell us about her research and about her tips for ongoing scientists and um, people interested in astronomy in general. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Hi, Sandra. Thanks for being here. Hello. Um, you're a PhD researcher at the Agelander Institute for Astronomy, and you're entering your final stretch of your PhD. So I'm really excited to talk to you about your research and what you've been doing and what you're studying. So what is your research topic? What are you working on? I'm working in the field of gravitational lensing. So I, I just give you a few words about gravitational lensing if, if you have not heard about this. So You have to imagine there are galaxies distributed all over the universe and, and they have light that travels to us. And this, this light ray is not just a straight line as you would maybe naively expect. No, according to Einstein's uh, general relativity, actually it travels around massive objects, just similar like if you have glasses, which then bends the light and, and, and focuses uh, for us. And then my specific field is weak gravitational lensing, where this effect is weak. So we can imagine that in the universe, there are just a lot of glasses or like lenses that do that. Actually, um, galaxies pose the, the best and the biggest telescopes we have in the whole universe. So they, they magnify things for us. They, you can also think of them as magnifying glasses instead of, of telescopes mm -hmm. or, or normal glasses. And, and, and they bring very far away objects um, in, into our range of observations. The good thing about them, they're cheap. <laughs> you don't have to put a single stand into having these big telescopes. And on the downside, you cannot put them where you want. So you just have to deal with what we have. And uh, unfortunately, there are billions of these galaxies and every single one acts in principle as one uh, single telescope so we can work quite well with that so we can actually use this to see objects that we would not see otherwise yes and uh, the cool thing is sometimes we even see it multiple times oh that's really cool so we can see the same thing different times yes and in in very extreme cases Like, for example, if you have a black hole, which is a lot of mass in a fine space, the, the light rays could even be bent as much as it travels back to you. But since it takes uh, quite some time for the light ray to travel, you, you can see an image of yourself from the past. Or maybe not from yourself, maybe only from Earth because you didn't exist back then. But yeah, so these are the extreme cases. You can see yourself from the past. That's the best mirror we have, I guess. Oh, that's really, really interesting. So actually you can bend the light ray backwards. That's what you can do. Yes. So apart from uh, actually seeing things multiple times and, uh, you know, seeing those backward images, what, what is the science that we can learn with it? What, what are the questions that we can answer? There are numerous questions and, and lensing provides multiple answers, but I will focus now on what I do specifically. And this is uh, that we, we check out cosmology and, and cosmology is observing and explaining the universe as a whole, you know, from its, uh, in, from, from its past state, how it then evolved the structures we see in the current universe and also how it will look in the future. And uh, for that, we specifically use this weak gravitational lensing effect that unfortunately has neither cool multiple images nor this uh, bending the light ray backwards. Okay, so what is, what is the difference between weak gravitational lensing and strong gravitational lensing? To put it simply, I think the strong gravitational lensing you can see by eye mm -hmm. and the weak gravitational lensing you can't. It's just a small distortion of the actual galaxy shape. So let's say it's 
the perfect circle, this galaxy, and then lensing will make a, a bit of an ellipse out of that. But the effect is only on a percent level or even lower. Mm -hmm. So it's just a much, much smaller effect. But in the end, it can tell us more because we can we, we see it in more galaxies. So, so what exactly is causing these distortions? So it's not like there really is a lens or something like that in the universe. Or... Yeah, so um, the, the thing that acts as a lens, as, as a glass, is uh, actually matter. So on the one hand, we, we have the galaxies but, uh, uh, also that surrounds us here on Earth. We call it the baryonic matter. And then there's also a thing we call the dark matter, which has the inherent feature that uh, it does not interact with light. That's why it's called dark matter. And this dark matter together with the normal matter, you know, the normal matter that interacts with light, these two together form uh, matter structures all over the universe. And they are, they are clumped a bit here, a bit there. And wherever a clump is, the light well will just slightly bend around that and it just wiggles its way to us, every single light wave. So in the end, it's the matter in the universe that actually distorts the light, especially the dark matter. Yes. So you're working on gravitational lensing and this weak gravitational lensing. Maybe you can explain a bit more what it is you do and how you do it. Yes. Okay. So, so first of all, what I do exactly is uh, let go back to this picture where, when light rays from one galaxy travel through you. Mm -hmm. And as I said, it's a weak distortion. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weak effect and it means it's, it's small. So You're both light rays uh, then travel through you and, and maybe they were initially this far apart, but now they're, they're a bit wider apart or a, a bit less apart. And then an object of a certain shape will then be squished into another shape. And the shape distortion is what we can measure quite easily. We call it shear. And the shear is then directly related to, to how much mass was there to, to actually cause this specific shear. But what happens also is now that you have another area of your object, you either see more light coming from this object or less. And we call this magnification effect. And it's way harder to measure because we never know how bright was this object initially and how much of this light has reached us. But the magnification is there. And you first think, May, ah, it's a good thing. We receive more light from it. It's brighter so we can observe more of these and we can observe them better. And yes, that is true. We can only see objects millions of years uh, across the universe because they are magnified. But on the downside is it also kind of changes um, the distribution of your galaxies on the sky. And since we use statistical methods, um, all this changing around of galaxies messes up our theoretical models. And, and I um, study the effect of how much is our theory messed up by the effect of, of this magnification. Okay, and the previous models just didn't include this and they had too few galaxies then, basically because they were not magnified in their theory. Um, yes, but that they were not wrong because the surveys we had in the past mm. did not really go that deep into the universe that this effect got important. Mm -hmm. So now that we have better surveys, better telescopes and larger surveys, it's get, it gets more important and more important. So you help to mitigate this effect. That, uh... Yeah, and this is my, my main work for the past three years. So, and how do you do your research, really? So you are not an observer, right? You don't go to a telescope and, and observe there. But what is it that you do? How, how do you do your day? During my usual day, I, I, I partly work with equations. So, you know, just getting the math done for all these models. But this doesn't get you very far. You get some, some good physical insights into things. But if you want more, if you want real, um, you know, if you want to really make an application of, okay, I think there's this effect, what will happen, then um, I personally move to simulations. Because simulations are the playground of an astronomer. You can just... You start with something that is the simulated universe and then you're like, oh, what happens if I have this? And then I put it in numerically and then I just see, okay, before, after, what's the difference? And this is exactly what I did with the magnification. Magnification of the foreground object, magnification of the background object, both, neither. And then I compared. You're recreating the universe, basically. 
Yes, that's what we do. That's what we do. We have some resolution issues <laughs> when it comes to Earth-like scales. Yeah, as soon as you get actually intelligent life in your simulations, then yeah. I never stop. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so what was one thing that actually surprised you doing your research? Is there something that um, you know you didn't expect when, before before starting your your project? Um, yes, there is something like that. However, it's not really um, it, it's not really my own scientific research that that surprises me. It was more like when when I started all this studying uh, physics first, then astrophysics, and now doing my PhD, I thought. If I really dive into the topic, if I if I learn the theory, if I attend seminars, schools, talk to different researchers, I, I will eventually get on a level where I really think, okay, I understood things. However, even now I feel like I don't know enough. I, there's always that much more, more to learn. You always meet all these super intelligent people that make you feel a bit inferior. And in the past years, I, I, I have figured out everyone feels like this in a way, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's, it's kind of normal. So um, I, I did not expect it. It really surprised me. And uh, I, I put a lot of effort into learning to deal with this, that uh, no one is perfect and, and we are just good enough. If we put in the effort, then we are like everyone else. <laughs> That's a really, really reassuring thought to hear that, you know, we be sure not everyone is an expert. And even though some people might seem like they really know everything, they don't. And yeah. What is something else that you think might be might be important to being an astronomer? Yeah, um, personally, for me, I think it's important not only as an astronomer, but scientists in general, that we not only communicate our own research to our um, peers, like to other scientists, what we usually do with attending conferences and giving a talk there or presenting a poster or writing a scientific article. Uh, I also think that it's important that we tell um, our research in easy words to the general public. Because in the end, it's taxpayers' money, which, um, which, which governs uh, all the scientific research, especially for astronomy, where we not really have a product in the end, you know, that we can sell. We only generate more knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So this, this also, I think, is an integral part of our work. And mm -hmm. we have to uh, tell um, everyone what we're doing with words they can understand. Mm -hmm. We will also help to, you know, Im improve the trust we have in science. And I think this is one of the major issues during these days that there's more and more mistrust during science. And maybe one of the reasons is that we don't really communicate. What I can do, I can communicate my own research. So this is what I try to do. I think that's a really, really important point. As a scientist, it's part of our responsibility to actually share our work with people that are not experts. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's come to, to a last question. Um, what is one piece of advice that you would give to a younger student, someone who's just in their master's or someone who's just interested in astronomy and like to, to learn more and do some more studies there? You may go to YouTube, check out some videos, or you hear podcasts, or you read a blog, or you, you, you buy yourself a book. Um, in the worst case, just drop me an email. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always happy to, to talk about uh, astronomy. Um, and if you're already studying this because you decided this is what you want to spend your life with, then, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Uh, for me, it helps interacting with uh, with with um, with other scientists. So people who do similar things than I do, or even you know related things only. This always broadens my horizon so much. Um, people who tell me about their own work, it really sticks in my mind if they tell me personally in their own words instead of just reading something somewhere. Mm. Yeah, so conversations with other scientists. Yeah, that's really, really helpful. Yeah. The main advice is talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> Not just staying in your own room and doing your own calculations. Yeah. Yes, that won't help anyone. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> staying in your own room, doing your own calculations, never, never has helped. I'm sure. You have to go out and tell people what you did and also let people tell you what they did. I think that's a really, really positive note to end on. Like, share your wisdom, communicate with other people. That's uh, really something that we can all do. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure. So thank you very much, Sandra. This was a really lovely talk that we had. And I really liked how her main message was um, talk to people. Uh, because we as scientists, we tend to stay in our room, do our own research and never really talk to other people. And it's really important for us to um, talk about our own research, um, talk with other scientists about their research. And this is really how, how you get ideas and how research is, is being done nowadays. So um, thank you very much. All the best for your upcoming PhD defense and see you soon.